is Russell Best. I'm Executive Director of Alumni and Donor Experience and Constituent Engagement for the Alumni Association at UC. Thank you very much for joining us today. Just a few housekeeping items. This is being uh, recorded. All participants are muted and your video has been disabled except for the panelists. Uh, if you just joined, please note that the audio can take a couple of minutes to connect. When we begin the Q&A portion of the program, you're encouraged to type and send questions in the chat box. We will do our best to answer as many questions as possible. If you need more help tech troubleshooting, please reach out to Lori McDermott. Her contact information uh, should have been your confirmation email. Uh, we'll now begin the program with a brief video message from the Executive Director of the Alumni Association, Jen Heisey. Welcome to today's program, one of many offered by your UC Alumni Association. Before we begin, it's important for me to say thank you for joining us. By actively participating in our offerings and experiences, you are harnessing the power of your alumni network. There are Bearcats all over the world, more than 315,000 alumni in 127 countries, which makes virtual programs like this so rewarding. These challenging times do come with a silver lining. We are more connected than ever before, creating boundless opportunities. The University of Cincinnati and each of you is stronger and better positioned because of our lifelong connections through our alma mater. We love providing opportunities like this one, where alumni can learn, network, and give back. So settle in and enjoy today's program. And if you like what you hear today, please share it on social media using the hashtag ThyLoyalChildren. Thanks again for joining us. Go Bearcats. Uh, I'm pleased to introduce our moderator for today's program, Dr. Lou Edgy. Lou is a board certified family physician with a master's in health professions education from the University of Michigan. She is the associate dean of the graduate medical education at the University of Cincinnati Medical Center, where she oversees the education of over 700 residents and fellows in almost 100 programs. She is currently a UC Moderna COVID-19 vaccine trial participant. Lou, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you very much for that welcome. Um, welcome to everybody for another episode of Behind the Scenes. Today, we have five excellent panelists who will each give us a look behind the curtain and provide a firsthand account of the inner workings of their area of expertise. I will introduce them on block after they have all presented about five minutes each. We will have time for questions and answers. Please put your questions in the chat. First, Dr. Sittenbaum will be speaking about the Moderna COVID-19 vaccine trial. He's an infectious disease physician at UC Health, professor in the Division of Infectious Diseases in the Department of Internal Medicine. He did his medical school at the University of Missouri at Kansas City, residency at Bridgeport Hospital, and fellowship at Yale University and Washington University School of Medicine. Second, we have Laura Cho, also with the Moderna trial. She's a primary care nurse practitioner at UC Health. She did her undergraduate education at Northern Kentucky University. Her graduate master's of science in nursing, family nursing at Xavier University and her post-masters in family nurse practice right here at University of Cincinnati. We also have Harold Dillow who will be speaking on supply chain. He is the assistant vice president of supply chain at UC Health. He did his undergraduate at the University of Kentucky and did his MBA at Loyola University in Chicago. We also have Dr. Aaron Kunda on a day in the life and an EM resident. He's a third year University of Cincinnati emergency medicine resident. He did his undergraduate education at Indiana University in South Bend and did his medical school at Indiana University School of Medicine. And finally, last but not least, we have Dr. Dustin Calhoun, who is on the Cincinnati, he will be speaking on the Cincinnati SWAT training. He is an ER doctor and medical director of the emergency management at UC Health. He's an associate professor of emergency medicine here at University of Cincinnati. He did his medical school at Medical College of Georgia and residency at Carolina's Medical Center. He also did his fellowship right here at UC. Matt, back to you. Thank you, Dr. Edgy.
So good afternoon, everybody. My name is Matt Martin. I'm a communications consultant for UC Health. I work in our marketing communications department. Um, I am the executive producer for our behind the scenes series uh, that UC Health does. Uh, I do a lot of the article writing and the reporting on scene when we do reporting. And then I work with our videographer when we reproduce the long form videos and stories for each season of behind the scenes. So to give you a little bit of background about UC Health, we are Greater Cincinnati's academic healthcare system. Our purpose is to advance healing, reduce suffering, and really to be the premier healthcare system uh, in Greater Cincinnati. Uh, our goal is to be the place where um, everybody in our community can come to receive the care they need. We don't want anybody to have to ever leave the region in order to receive the care that they need. Uh, we have over 12,000 uh, team members, including 10,000 employees, 942 UC Health physicians, which include Dr. Edgy, Dr. Fichtenbaum, and Dr. Calhoun. We also have 849 clinical residents and fellows, 492 advanced practice providers. We have four inpatient campuses, which include UC Medical Center here on our Clifton campus, Westchester Hospital on our Westchester campus, the Daniel Drake Center, um, which is over near uh, Wyoming, and then also the Lindner Center of Hope, which is near the uh, Mason area near Kings Island. Uh, so in terms of our patients, we have served uh, in the last fiscal year, uh, fiscal year 20, which extends from July 2019 to June 2020, we served 371,790 patients from all 50 states and also had 2 million uh, visits and admissions to our facilities. So to give a little bit of background about what behind the scenes is, so uh, behind the scenes started a few years ago in our marketing communications department, um, and we really want to give an in-depth look at what healthcare is and kind of you know, really get past the stigma of kind of healthcare. I know a lot of people don't really think about healthcare until you need it. Uh, that's just something that none of us really think about until it gets to that point where we need uh, potentially some type of care, whether it's uh, for a type of injury uh, for whatever it might be. So we really want to find a way to tell the story of what our experts do uh, in a way that no other healthcare system in the region and very few in the country do. So behind the scenes is an episodic mini series that basically uh, tells these stories. And so each season, which we do usually one or two seasons per year with about four episodes that run every other week, uh, basically we go in each episode and tell a story of perhaps a care team at one of our facilities, perhaps a specific physician, or perhaps even some of our experts on our non-clinical side. And basically we go in, we follow that team around, we follow those experts around and see the work that they do. Um, we are one of the, uh, again, we are the only healthcare system in the region to really offer this type of all access to our care teams, to our physicians and our experts, and one of the few in the country to do it in a Netflix style uh, series. Really, a lot of the inspiration for this came from very popular uh, medical shows that you'll see like ER. Um, we really wanted to try to tell a story in that type of way with the type of drama as well that you'll see on those types of shows as well. Um, so really, uh, some of the goals of the series to demystify the delivery of healthcare by tapping into the natural curiosities consumers have about the medical field. Uh, in addition, also increase our UC Health brand exposure uh, as Greater Cincinnati's academic healthcare system, and really to be able to give consumers a look at what an academic healthcare system is uh, compared to community medicine. And then also, we want to humanize our clinicians and experts. So for season five. In the past, we've done uh, episodes with heart transplant. We featured our air care team. We've gone in and seen deep brain stimulation, which is a type of neurological procedure. Uh, we featured our uh, trauma centers at both UC Medical Center and Westchester. Uh, so we really try to feature as many different types of areas and our specialties that we have to offer at UC Health, and also to give insight into some of the other areas that perhaps are on the non-clinical side. So what you'll see in this season. So. Uh, we did four episodes this season. The first one is on UC Health's role in the COVID-19 Moderna vaccine trial. Episode two is on UC Health supply chain. So again, on the non-clinical side, what our teams do on a daily basis to make sure our hospitals have the medical supplies that they need to give world-class care to our patients. Episode three takes you behind the scenes of a day in the life of an emergency medicine resident. Again, one of the cool things about UC Health is our partnership with the University of Cincinnati College of Medicine. And so a lot of our physicians teach and work at the College of Medicine. And then, of course, we also have residents who work in our hospitals as well, who are completing their residency 
and fellowships uh, at our facilities as well. And then last but certainly not least, we also uh, did an episode this season to share um, our partnership, UC Health, with Cincinnati SWAT team. Uh, very few people probably know that some of our physicians and residents actually work with our SWAT team. And so we'll kind of talk about that today as well. So to kind of start off, um, episode one, which premiered back in uh, early February, uh, again, talks about our role with the COVID-19 uh, vaccine trial. And so uh, with that, uh, basically, we tell the story from when the vaccine trial uh, in partnership with Moderna started uh, back in August this year. Uh, from our very first participant in the trial and through the stages from when the Moderna vaccine was approved for emergency use authorization in December. And so to here to talk about the episode today are Laura Cho and Dr. Fichtenbaum. So uh, either one of you can jump in. Laura, if you'd like to start off and talk about kind of your role within the trial, um, and then Dr. Fichtenbaum, you can also uh, do the same. Hi there. Thanks, Matt. Um, and thanks for having us with you today as well. Um, my role as a nurse practitioner within the Moderna trial is really to provide support to the physicians, um, the project investigators, which is Dr. Fichtenbaum, um, and all of the other clinical staff, and to provide care for our patients. Um, you know, and, and the main push was really exciting to be a part of um, finding a safe and effective vaccine um, during these times. And we have, you know, proven to do so so far and continue to collect research on this. Um, so as a nurse practitioner, um, like I said, we do provide support. Um, we do see the patients, each and every one, when they come in for vaccine um, appointments and physical exams, um, collaborating with the physicians to discuss illnesses, um, any other type of possible events that come up um, that could potentially be study related and from there, we do provide a lot of patient support um, and just clinical support. And Dr. Fichtenbaum, are you on here as well? I am. I am indeed. Yeah. So, uh, you know, in um, in uh, May, there was uh, a group that was uh, sponsored by the NIH called the uh, CoVPN, which is the Coronavirus Prevention Network. And this was formed at the behest of Francis Collins and Tony Fauci uh, using all of their different funded uh, National Institute of Health uh, clinical operations uh, that were able to do research. We started meeting and there were discussions early on about vaccine and so I sent a message uh, to the leadership of the Academic Health Center, uh, the dean of the college, the president of the university, and I said, well, I know we don't really do big vaccine studies, but I think we should do a big vaccine study. Are you willing to do what it takes to sort of support that effort? And hands down, they said they were all in, and I said, okay. Well, then I'll throw our hat into the ring. And then uh, a few weeks later, I responded back to the leadership and said, be careful what you wish for, because now your dream just came true. And behind the scenes, we had to organize uh, finding a space, hiring people, and, and getting a trial up and running in record time. And normally that might take uh, anywhere from uh, two to three months just to negotiate a contract. It took less than two weeks. Uh, normally it would take us a long time to get space and hire people. And we did it within a month or two. And so uh, we also formed, uh, because I recognized that it was gonna be really important that we engage all of the communities that live in Cincinnati and those that have historically been left out of care and also been left out of studies because uh, people made assumptions that were wrong. And so I reached out to leaders in the Black and African American community and to those within the Latino and Hispanic communities and started forming community partnerships so that we could 
have a trial that was representative of our community uh, and that really was believable by all and so that we were able to offer it to everyone and that takes time and effort to do that and I was, I was just incredibly proud of our team uh, all the support we got from the university from the health system uh, it takes many hands to make this work and so it was really a um, a very useful thing and I remember very vividly um, we took a picture on the day that the results came out outside um, and I spent a few moments applauding that team because they deserved it uh, more than uh, 50 plus individuals who worked very very hard and people who do all sorts of unseen things around the university uh, from those who clean the rooms and keep us all safe and healthy uh, to those who do the marketing uh, and everything in between. So it was really um, an honor to be part of a team and to do this and, and behind the scenes. And there were lots of things that happened that many of you saw, including Operation Warp Speed leadership coming to see us and an HBO documentary being filmed and all sorts of, uh, of things. But what I'm most proud of is the entire team and also the prominence that have been gained by our study participants, uh, some of whom were, were on um, uh, CNN, uh, and also uh, the physicians and leaders within uh, underrepresented communities like Dr. Edgy, Dr. Powell uh, getting national prominence and and really being part of uh, something that is hopefully guiding a conversation for a healthy Cincinnati. Thank you, thank Dr. Pectamal, and thank you, Laura. So, episode two behind the scenes this season, we wanted to take you inside a part of healthcare that perhaps you may not see necessarily on a day to day basis really to give you a look at some of the teams that work really behind the scenes to ensure that our hospitals run efficiently, our physicians, our clinicians have everything they need to deliver world-class care to our patients here in greater Cincinnati. And so one of the teams that has been a huge part of that, particularly during the COVID-19 pandemic, is our supply chain team. So for episode two, we followed around uh, some of our members of our supply chain team uh, and really took a look at how do supplies get to patient rooms? So how do they, from the moment they arrive on our campus, how do they get into our warehouse? Then how do they make their way over to our facilities? Again, our hospitals and also our outpatient uh, care centers as well. So uh, Harold and his team were gracious enough to allow us that access to see what that process is like. So Harold, if you would like to speak more on that. Sure, thanks Matt. So hello everyone, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Harold Dillo. Um, and I uh, represent supply chain at UC Health. Um, I think the um, uh, docu series is is perfectly named for supply chain behind the scenes because that's that's how we operate. We want to be behind the scenes and it really be transparent to uh, clients, um, and patients that we're providing. Uh, in some instances, um, life saving supplies for. So that's that's really what. Um, we take seriously is that, that we're helping to care for patients by providing um, the supplies that the clinicians need um, at the right time. So um, really appreciated being highlighted along with these um, other videos, this, um, this docu-series. Um, pretty uh, good timing. Uh, healthcare supply chain was at front and center uh, at the forefront during the pandemic. Um, so you know, supply chain is really made up of a couple of different um, uh, functions. The one on the video is our logistics and materials um, arm. And what they're really responsible for is uh, receiving items on our receiving uh, delivery dock and uh, warehousing them, uh, getting them in the right uh, units of measure to deliver to our point of care areas. So it would go from our central 
uh, receiving dock to one of our um, acute or ambulatory areas. And then through there, the video highlights kind of some other the processes that the, the really product flow of the items um, all the way up into a bin, as Matt mentioned, on a point of use um, nursing floor. Um, you know, we have about, I would say, 250 to 260 folks in supply chain across all of our different sites. And, you know, it takes an army of people to make sure that just every single item gets to the right spot. Um, other areas that are extremely critical uh, to supply chain um, is our sourcing and value analysis teams. So, um, you know, one of the the, particip uh, the uh, participants on here I see is uh, you know, Derek Billups, who's also who runs that area of our supply chain, and we partner with them to make sure that we can forecast and have insight into the industry of what is happening with supplies, and do we have uh, the right vendors? Are we getting the right supplies? Uh, do we have plenty of um, items in the pipeline to receive? Uh, working with the physicians and clinicians uh, on value analysis committees to make sure that we have the right items that they approve um, in order to take care of the patients at the highest level. And so that's really the other big piece of it. Um, some other areas in our supply chain include our systems and analytics team. So, you know, we don't just order random amounts of product. All of that is based off of data and analytics that we use to determine our PAR levels. And that has never been more important than the past year of COVID um, because we had to right, have the right amount of safety stock on hand in order to weather what was, um, you know, extremely uh, stressful and long hours for the first few months of COVID in order to make sure we had the right stuff for everyone. And, you know, I set on, uh, I can't remember what the original team was called, but now it's called the COVID core team with, uh, Dr. Calhoun, he'll talk here in a minute, and um, we were in the same room for many, many months um, trying to understand what the evolving PPE criteria was um, for the clinicians uh, to use to take care of COVID patients and then ultimately trying to source that product, um, which was exacerbated because we weren't just competing against other healthcare systems, we were competing against governments, uh, including our own. So where we would typically just, uh, you know, call Medline or Cardinal or Owens and Minor, who are the major uh, supply distributors in the healthcare industry to get product or alternate product, we could no longer do that because uh, the U.S. government, other governments had already bought it from them. So we were really uh, turned into international sourcing uh, for UC Health right here in Cincinnati. So. Um, anyways, just appreciate the opportunity. Uh, the video highlights one area of supply chain, but I, I wanted to talk about the other areas that are just as critical and um, look forward to answering any questions later. So thank you. Thank you, Harold. So with episode three, we uh, take you inside uh, our emergency department through the lens of one of our emergency medicine residents. Of course, UC Health, we train one out of three doctors who work in the region. And so really what a, a huge part of the work that we do um, includes the work that our residents do in our facilities. And so one of our residents, uh, Edmund Irankunda, was gracious enough to really take us through a day for him uh, as an emergency medicine resident. Uh, so that was really the focus of episode three. So Dr. Irankunda, I will hand it off to you now. Thanks, Matt. Um, so in this video, I talked about one of the many sites that we rotate, which is University of Cincinnati Medical Center. Um, we have the privilege training here in Cincinnati to go to multiple sites. And so this includes Westchester and uh, our children's sites. And in this particular shift, it's very different in regards to emergency medicine uh, when you describe a typical day because we work different shifts and um, di work at different hours and overnights. And so in this particular day, it was a morning shift. And so it was uh, one of those days where um, there's always like a calm before the storm and uh, We'll show you different parts of the um, duration interactions with different staff members and just what training in Cincinnati feels like. And uh, one of the other things that a lot of residents do have here is a support structure, which includes family members. And so uh, one of the biggest struggles, especially going through COVID is making sure that you uh, stay safe and you also protect your family and loved ones. And so uh, we discussed part of, uh, in regards to my personal, um, 
family, I have my wife and a son, and how they have been a support system for me during my training time here in Cincinnati. And so with this program being the first residency program in the country and our class being the 51st uh, residency class, um, it was an honor and privilege to show you what a average day uh, might look like for an emergency medicine resident and just to take you through our uh, most popular training site at University of Cincinnati. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yankunda. And for our last episode of season five, uh, which will be coming soon, uh, we talk about UC Health's partnership with Cincinnati SWAT team. So many people may not know that our uh, some of our emergency medicine physicians and residents work with our Cincinnati SWAT team and Cincinnati Police Department and do uh, various training. Um, our physicians are part of the SWAT team. Uh, they provide medical direction for the team, help uh, give basic trauma education to the team. So in the event that if they needed to deliver some type of life saving care themselves, they would be prepared for that. So uh, our, some of our physicians work really closely with that. Uh, one of them is Dr. Calhoun, who's been with the team for 10 years. Uh, so I will hand it off to him. Thanks, Matt. Um, yeah, so we provide uh, medical control, medical direction, um, and medical support uh, for the several tactical teams in the region. Obviously, tactical operations that law enforcement perform um, are, are dangerous. Um, we've seen, un unfortunately, not too far from here, some fairly tragic events um, over the past few years. Um, the military model of putting medical, dedicated medical personnel with uh, law enforcement operations have progressively become more and more common. Most places you see uh, tactical paramedics with specialized tactical training doing that. Due to the uh, support of UC Health and UC, we've actually here been able to step that up a little bit further for our urban uh, Cincinnati Police Department SWAT team and actually staff them with uh, an emergency physician and a resident emergency physician or an attending emergency physician uh, for about 99, uh, 95 to 99% of the operations that they do, we're able to put at least one physician with them. Um, and then also providing that non-tactical operation support that would go into tactical medicine. Uh, it's one of the one of my favorite parts of my job. Um, I do a lot of different EMS and operational medicine things. Tactical medicine fits into that. Um, we have at any time anywhere from 15 to 20 uh, residents and attendings that are part of the tactical team from our emergency department. Dr. Aaron Quinda is actually one of our um, deputy resident assistant medical directors. Uh, or no, actually, yes, yes. As of July, he'll be our uh, resident assistant medical director for that team. Um, I get confused as to what year we're in. Uh, so uh, it's a great team. Uh, we work very closely with the tactical operations. We are considered part of the team. Um, all members have gone through the same physical testing requirements to get on the team uh, and have gone through basic tactical training, firearm safety training, um, as well as tactical medical training. And we regularly train with the team. So um, a very, it's a great opportunity to provide an invaluable service that the SWAT team would not be able to obtain were it not for the support of UC and UC Health. Uh, so thank you for the privilege provided by the organizations and for the ability to present to let this, like Matt said, sort of not well known aspect of what we do um, to get uh, get it out there a little bit. Thank you, Dr. Calhoun. I believe we are going to now move on to our question and answer section. So Dr. Edgy, I will hand it back off to you. Thank you so much, Matt. I appreciate it. And it's just been excellent to hear what's going on behind the scenes here at UC and how we've just been an instrumental part of moving things forward in this pandemic. Um, just wanted to go ahead and touch on a couple of questions that have come through. Um, the first one, what has been the most challenging part of the vaccine trial? And this is to Dr. Fichtenbaum. Well, I think the most challenging part was just trying to put all the pieces together as uh, sort of the grand orchestrator of it and to um, do it in a way in which everyone feel, felt valued from the people working on it to the study participants who I know that people often refer to first responders as heroes, heroines, but I really refer to the study participants that way because they make all the difference in the world. They're taking a leap of faith with us and they're trying to build a better world. So, and I hope they tell their children and their grandchildren what they did because it's very much like the people who built, you know, the buildings downtown. They do all of the work and 
somebody else's name gets on the building, but they yeah. laid the bricks and put the iron up. Um, and so, you know, orchestrating all those pieces and trying to keep every ha everybody happy and making sure that I uh, always stayed calm, uh, except when I yelled at Dr. Calhoun, um, then, which I didn't do, but, you know, I'd like to. Uh, but I think it's that that was really the challenging uh, thing to me. Uh, and then um, the one of the here a behind the scenes thing. Um, Moderna is a very new company and their ability to conduct a trial is pretty evident. Uh, and also, uh, the number of trials being done with the support systems in place. There were. Uh, there's a lot of chaos behind the scenes that no one gets to see that irritated the heck out of my staff. And I think at this point, it would be great to hear from Laura Cho to tell us a little bit about her experiences on this front. Thank you, Dr. Fickenbaum. Laura, go right ahead, please. Hi there, thank you. Um, I think it, it was a challenge, um, both to within our trial here and our staff up here, which is such an awesome team. Um, together, we were able to keep up our optimism, um, optimism for each other and optimism for you know, our participants and the appreciation we have for our participants being here is really the groundwork for us to, like Dr. Fichtenbaum said, to be able to move forward and Without them, really, we wouldn't be where we are today. And our staff up here on the other side of things, trying to keep that calm, the calm before the storm, because it was a constant changing environment. And I think not only constant in the outside world, what's going on with our community, um, businesses, things like that, but you know, individually, um, there were just a lot of impacts and with the trial, there were a lot of constant changes and updates and things and and just keeping up with all of that to make sure that we could make this trial as, as successful as it was. So coordinating all that, Dr. Fichtenbaum is fantastic, but it really took our whole team up here. Um, and I know the article, uh, the video focuses a lot on the team and I think that's really important. Um, because it did, it's, it's up here, we have multiple different roles um, and throughout our whole, you know, building to really make this trial be able to happen. So those are all challenging factors. Hey, Absolutely. Hey, Laura. I think Dr. Fittenbaum was, go ahead, please. Laura, can you just, just for the people behind the scenes, explain to them what a query is? And, ha and and just give them sort of some idea about queries, because I think that's a nice way of showing people a very small slice of something that um, was a challenge for people. That's very true. So queries are, um, they are small messages, memos almost that come back to us asking questions about different documentation um, that we have, whether it's events for the participants um, and being able to look at these queries and make associations trying to decide is it study related or is it not? And we get approximately our, our query bank stays about between 80 and 90 a day that we constantly turn over and work through and we're trying to provide as much thorough information to Moderna as possible as we do in all clinical trials. Um, and it has been very thorough, but that is definitely a challenge for us to um, be able to coordinate that information. So an example would be, um, you know, if you had uh, a fever, for example, and we would want to know why you had the fever, when it started, start and stop dates, medications that you took for this, um, how far from vaccine time was this? Was it potentially related and potentially not? Um, and it was a double blind trial at the beginning before everyone was unblinded. So we weren't sure who received placebo and who received vaccine. So the importance of these queries, these um, initiation for more information about these events for patients is it was incredible. And we're still getting um, everyday queries coming back of well, we'd like to know more about this. Um, we'd like to know more about these events and it takes all of us to work through them constantly, um, but definitely a challenge. 
An excellent example of teamwork. And um, you are a phenomenal conductor, Dr. Bickerbaum. I know as a participant myself. Um, this question is for supply chain. Um, after this COVID experience, what supplies do you think will be better off manufactured in the United States to avoid availability issues? Yeah, great question. I was actually just trying to type back so it's easier to, to talk through it. So, um, uh, and also, you know, if, if Dr. Calvin wants to jump in too, um, certainly any of the PPE. So, like I mentioned earlier, uh, sat in a room with Dr. Calhoun, and and if Dr. Fichtenbaum didn't yell at Dr. Calhoun, I can tell you that Dr. Calhoun definitely <laughs> was passionate in our COVID core team meetings throughout many months. Uh, I learned a lot from him um, as the only non-clinician on the panel, so um, I want to say thank you to him for that. But yeah, PPE was critical. I mean, we had. Um, you know, we had a, a safety stock, uh, you know, we, we've been through Ebola, we've been through a couple other things before, but the trick is, is that each one of them uh, is a little bit different than what you need. And there's a sweet spot of, you know, we could buy all the PP in the world, millions of dollars of it, and, and it just sits around, right? But that could be millions of dollars. We could be spending building new patient care towers or whatever. So how much do you really need? And so that that's, um, that's really the the key to it, and I think having uh, onshoring PPE is critical. Um, ironically, and I don't know if everyone knows this, but Wuhan, uh, Wuhan, China, where it started, right, is like the PPE capital of the world. Go figure, right? So Medline, all of these other companies produce the majority of all their PPE in that city. Unbelievable. So that was pretty much cut off. And we started having to source items from alternate vendors, some of them stateside. Um, we had a luckily we have a really thorough vetting process for our vendors because there's fly by night vendors that were popping up left and right, trying to sell us stuff that we, you know, couldn't vet properly. So certainly in 95s gowns, um, gloves, goggles you know, need to be uh, on short and, and some of the big players like Medline are doing that now. Um, but, you know, it's it's too easy for the government to come in and buy up all the inventory and us be left stranded. So I don't, Dr. Calhoun, would you like to add anything to that? No, I think that you know, the PPE is the one that's such an expendable uh, and uh, such a um, it, it fluctuant as far as what you need, when you need it. Um, so the ability to produce that in-house, I think you hit the nail on the head there. And I just want to take one second to say that I, I am so appreciative of God. I'm the lucky person here who has managed to work with a ton of the people you see on the cameras here. I've gotten to work closely with Dr. Fichtenbaum, uh, Dr. Nkunda, Harold, Dr. Edgy, um, and that's been a tremendous privilege to me. And I think it really illustrates the, that what we do is teamwork. Um, and the teams that we've been able to, that I've, I've been fortunate and lucky to be a part of, um, have been amazing. And these people on this panel, it, it's such an honor to just be sitting side by, virtually side by side with these folks on this, on this panel. Thank Do you. Dr. 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 Edgy, Dr. Dr. Edgy, can I, yeah. can I just Go ask ahead. Dr. Harold, Harold, can you tell them the story about how a shipment of ours, of PPE got confiscated in New York? Because people love to know those behind the scenes things that nobody ever hears about, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Um, can everybody still hear me? We can. Okay, sorry, my video is messing up for some reason. Um, yeah, so it, it was pretty incredible. So we um, had product, there's a couple of different stories. So one of them was we were sourcing product, uh, I think it was coming out of Egypt for some reason this time and it shows up uh, in New York and um, gets confiscated. It, another story we had was we were sourcing directly with, um, actually the Chinese chamber in Cincinnati was helping us on this one, sourced directly with a manufacturer in China. And it, I don't know, not really funny, I guess, but it, um, we had everything lined up and then the chamber called us and said, hey, you're not going to get your shipment. No, by the way, the, the, the person that we were working with um, has been arrested. Like they, we oh can't goodness. contact with them anymore. I mean, it, it, it's amazing stories. Uh, you know, we've um, we had one shipment that 
uh, did arrive in New York and we, uh, the vendor we were working with had to hire a private security company to follow the shipment from New York to Cincinnati because he wasn't confident that state police and others wouldn't pull the semi truck over and confiscate it. I, I mean, it's, wow. it's something like out of a movie. It was incredible. So. Well, thanks wow. for sharing the story. Um, Eddie, I wanted to go ahead and have you answer this question. Why did you choose emergency medicine? Um, I had a very strong mentor when I was an undergrad who happened to be a graduate of this program. And so he told me before I uh, picked uh, any field just to try everything out. In emergency medicine, I'm fortunate enough to practice in a field that allows me to see patients and people from all different types of backgrounds. And I really like the variety and uh, how every day is unpredictable. And one thing I really liked about this place in particular is the breadth of exposure that you get as a resident. And so going to one of the top training sites for adult medicine and pediatric medicine and having all of that in one city like Cincinnati was a uh, an experience that I did not want to miss out on. So when I spent uh, four weeks here in Cincinnati as a medical student, I knew by the end of my rotation that there was no other place I'd rather go. And then you do all the different things like Dr. Calhoun was talking about, flying, uh, doing helicopter EMS, uh, working with uh, SWAT teams. And so I felt like when it came to training for an emergency medicine doctor, this was the program that gave me all the different tools that I needed to be the best clinician out there at the end of the day when I'm done with my training. Excellent. We're so fortunate to have you in our program. Um, how do you balance? This is a follow up question for you. How do you balance your work life and time with family? That's a great question. Uh, my 3 year old will tell you that I'm still working on it, um, <laughs> but I really have tried to find things that I'm interested in things that I feel like I'm effective in regards to like extracurricular things outside of clinical work and then making sure that I've dedicated time where I spend with my toddler, spend with my wife. Uh, we, I've realized that having um, time away from medical related things really has helped with uh, giving me the time to rejuvenate and feel like every, every shift that I go into, I'm ready to approach uh, the different uh, patient encounter that I have. We definitely deal with a lot of sick patients, some challenging times. And so it's nice having that support structure. And so having some dedicated time that I spend with family uh, and then time that I just take away, I usually will go to the park and just kind of I spend some time with myself to just kind of clear my mind is one of those things that I felt like has helped me as a provider and also has helped me be a better husband and father as well. Yeah, excellent lessons there. Dr. Calhoun, one for you. How do you apply the work you do as a SWAT physician to your role in treating physician phys or patients rather in the hospital? Um, so it's kind of interesting. It's similar to uh, things learned from EMS. Uh, you if you never leave the hospital, which is the case for, for the vast majority of, of physicians, that's where we are most efficient and where we're able to do the most good. Um, there is an ability to, or an inability to completely appreciate some of the circumstances where our patients come from. Um, so entering houses, seeing the circumstances where people live, and, and that's in, in good and in bad, um, has a huge benefit to being able to empathize and understand where they're coming from and, and see some of the barriers that they're dealing with. Um, being in a neighborhood where the SWAT operation is occurring and seeing the next door neighbor who has absolutely nothing to do with what brought the SWAT team there, but seeing a, a small child there who is having to deal with that being part of their life. Um, or a family who's trying to do the right thing, but suffering from dealing with their next door neighbor who now the SWAT team is breaking down their door, um, makes you at least to some degree better understand the limitations that the patients have when they come to us um, and have issues. And they're in the emergency department for something that I probably would go to my primary care doctor for, but their circumstances may not allow that. And that's not a decision um, in many cases. So I think that's probably the greatest lesson I learned from all of the pre hospital medicine that I get to do. Excellent. Excellent. Well, we're coming right up on time. Um, so I'm going to uh, send it back to the team. For, uh, to closing, thank you so much to our panelists for giving us an excellent experience um, behind the scenes. Lou, thank you very much and really appreciate everyone joining us during uh, if you're on the East Coast around your lunch hour here. Uh, and thank you to our panelists for taking the time to share these behind the scenes uh, viewpoints and the mini series. Uh, Matt, if you could, 
I suppose I have one more question to share here with the group. When will the mini series drop? And uh, should people just go to the behind the scenes main webpage uh, to view those episodes? Sure, you sure. can actually see uh, past episodes there. Um, but we also uh, launched a new uh, we uh, new site for uchealth.com. So all of our episodes are also there. Um, we have so far launched the first three episodes of season five. Uh, the last one that Dr. Calhoun is a part of with our Cincinnati SWAT team will be launching here in the next week or two. Uh, but you can find all those episodes on uchealth.com uh, or you can Google uh, UC Health uh, Media Room. It will be there as well. Um, you can also find all of the videos from this season and past seasons on our YouTube channel. Great, thank you very much. Uh, and yes, keep an eye out uh, for a post event email here that we'll send within the next few days here that we'll have a recording of this program. Uh, and we will also link out uh, to that web page for participants. Uh, and just as a, a couple closing remarks here, just a reminder that this is one of our many programs, our new and growing virtual health series uh, for the Alumni Association called Bearcats Health that we've been doing in partnership with UC Health and the Academic Health Centers. Uh, we have a handful of upcoming programs celebrating diverse women in pharmacy next Tuesday, March 30th on April 1st, addressing inequity as allied health professionals. And on Wednesday, April 14th, during alumni week, week which I'll get to here shortly, uh, a mass parental incarceration and child health equity program. That's on Wednesday, April 14th. Just quickly want to plug Bearcats Connect, which is a, a new virtual online program that the Alumni Association has now been offering since last August. Uh, it's our new online platform where alumni, students, faculty, and staff can network, mentor, and grow professionally. Uh, we encourage you to sign up. We have thousands that have now joined, joined the platform, and we uh, look forward to continuing to grow that as an opportunity to connect Bearcats to one another uh, in the online space. And then lastly, just want to mention, I touched on uh, April 14th, uh, we have a health program during Alumni Week, but Alumni Week is April 12th through the 18th. And if you go to the Alumni Association's website, it's just alumni.uc.edu. We'll have information on the week and we have a handful of programs, including recognizing our alumni through a, a virtual uh, celebration throughout the week. Uh, UC's Day of Giving is April 15th uh, through the 16th. It's a 24-hour philanthropic challenge uh, and a host of other online and virtual programs uh, during that time. So we hope to see you then virtually. Uh, thank you again one last time here for uh, our moderator, Lou, and our presenters, and thank you to everyone for tuning in. Go Bearcats.